and they're um, sort of like the imprinting for them at whatever point in their career, or birth stories that are just significant to them for whatever reason that may be. And so what I'll ask each of you to do is just give a short intro to yourself, how many years that you've been engaged in birth work, anything else that you feel like is relevant to share, and, um, and then one or two stories, depending on what speaks to you and what you're feeling like in the moment, it's fine. On average, it's about 15 minutes per person. And um, is there anyone that wants to volunteer to be the first panelist? Because both ends have said, okay, great. Because both ends were like the other end. So this is Jane. Yes, Jane's going to turn on her mic there. Just push up. Hello, hello. Awesome. Okay, here we go. I just want to record what I'm going to say in case I say something clever. <laughs> that would be a real gem. So yes, my name is Jane Hardwick Collings and I'm from Australia, which is a very long way away from here. And um, I did my midwifery training after I did my general nursing training in Australia. and. So I was 25 when I did my midwifery training, which was a one-year course after having done three years as uh, nursing training. And I did my midwifery training because I wanted to have a baby, and I just wanted to learn all about it. And it was quite a shock to see what was going on in the system. Um, uh, it was really the awakening for me. I was a good daughter of the patriarchy until I saw what was going on in maternity hospitals. And truly nothing less than institutionalised abuse on women masquerading as safety. Um, and I couldn't get out of the hospital system fast enough and straight after my training went and did an apprenticeship with one of the few home birth midwives in Sydney in Australia where I lived. And I spent a year with her and then started my own midwifery, home birth midwifery practice. And um, that was basically 30 years ago. And I've been um, going to births and doing lots of other things along the way, living overseas, traveling, having other businesses. And I now have started this school of shamanic midwifery, which is basically a women's mystery school, which learns about the women's mysteries, the blood rites, and shamanic birthing, and all that sort of stuff. And I've just started taking all of that to the world, and have come here via the UK and France giving workshops, so it's all very exciting. And when I was thinking about what birth story I'd like to share, ooh, it's a sign. <laughs> um, there's many to choose from, and I wanted to find the one that was really pivotal in um, informing me with how I practiced after that. And I didn't really know which one to choose, so I sat down in the crafting room and started knitting. And thought, well, this will calm my beta brain waves down and I will feel the one that wants to be spoken come, and it did. And it's my own experience of giving birth for the first time, which was such, um, such an awakening for me. I'd, I'd been a home birth midwife for a couple of years already, and I'd left the system saying, I'm going to be a home birth midwife, and, you know, I'm going to have a home birth, and na 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 And, um, yes, shameful as such. And I... I went into labour and had a normal sort of progression of what was, you know, labour unfolding and got to pushing and pushed and pushed for hours and hours and hours and couldn't budge my baby boy um, and went back to that hospital that I had trained at with my tail between my legs back to those people who I had said there, 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 there to, to experience a very big, important dose of humility. And um, 
I learned from the unfolding of this birth experience how there's so much more going on than the physiology and that my first experience of giving birth, my first visit to the birth altar, um, that's my priestess talk, uh, was a really big lesson for me about what I needed to learn about myself. And the first thing was humility. I needed to be um, much less of a smarty pants and more open to what life held rather than having big sort of um, ideologies and expectations about what was right and what was wrong and all that kind of stuff. So it was a good lesson to learn. And I ended up having a cesarean because um, labor was just going on and there was no progress. And I had my baby boy and had a lovely postnatal experience with him. And then after a little while, I started thinking about how upset I was that I hadn't had a vaginal birth and started this process that really showed me how much more influenced birth than what you could see. And I, I went through a process that I ended up kind of using as a midwife with others of feeling into when I had felt like how I was feeling after having a caesarean, when I had felt like that before in my life and was able to see that there was a pattern of times when I had felt like this kind of like, oh, nothing I ever want really happens. And, um, I can't do what I really want to do and, you know, those sorts of things that I've been telling myself, although I didn't realise it over and over and over again on my life. And I did a little bit of a forensic dig into my past, tracking back. When did I feel like that before? When did I feel like that before? When did I feel like that before? To a time when, well, the original wound that caused that pattern, which was just something happening over and over again, so I would get my own attention and realize I had choice around it rather than repeating it. And so, um, as a four-year-old, I had been very sick in hospital, and <clears throat> the story goes that I nearly died, and um, my mother would have been sitting beside me saying, don't die. You know, you can imagine what you would be saying to your four-year-old, even if you're not saying it, what you would be feeling. And, um, you know, like, don't give in, or come through, whatever, whatever. Anyway, don't leave me. Don't leave me all that sort of stuff. And then the story, I was going to have half my lung cut out the next day because I was so sick and blah, blah, blah. And then the story goes that I miraculously recovered overnight. And um, then I grew up and all was good and blah, 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 until I went to have a baby. And um, what I realized I had done way back there as a four-year-old was um, what my mother asked me to do was to um, not give in. So I had made this kind of deal with myself that I would not give in to something bigger than me, which was this germ or whatever that was, you know, making me sick. And so come to the birth altar, you know, I'd already made this pact that I wasn't going to give in to something bigger than me, and the birth force is you know, something way bigger than any of us. And I, I had already made this deal that I would not give in to something bigger than me. So therefore, I, I wasn't able to find the surrender button. And um, it was huge to learn that and to learn it on myself rather than to um, kind of read it in a textbook or observe it in other women giving birth. And when I had, um, in preparation for my next birth, and the doctor had said to me, look, you'll never get a baby out of your pelvis, Jane. Your ischial spines are 
prominent. You should just have cesareans. It'll be okay, blah, blah, blah. So I went into um, my second birth, planning to have a vaginal birth after cesarean at home, and that was 25 years ago in a time when once a cesarean, always a cesarean, and all that kind of stuff. So I really know what it takes to have a VBAC, and it's like absolute faith and trust in your body and the process. And so what I'm, I had a beautiful vaginal birth, and then another one a few years later. So what I learned, and the, the pulling this all together, the story that I wanted to share with you was through my own personal experience, I realized that our um, rites of passage are actually where the sacred meets the mundane. So mundane meaning regular, everyday miracles like birth um, and menstrual cycles and all of that. Uh, our rites of passage are like portals or gateways into the sacred where our soul path or our um, life journey of our soul unfolds in the outcome of the stories and how they unfold. And I learned through my experiences of giving birth what the big lessons I needed to learn in my life about surrender and trust and presence. And um, I was then able to bring that perspective to my practice as a midwife in helping women to fundamentally debrief when birth didn't go the way that they wanted it to, to actually ask, well, what is this telling you about yourself? What can you learn about yourself? When have you felt like this before, 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 before? And to find the origin of the pattern that was playing out during um, their rites of passage to then realise that they had choice in how they um, met that experience again and that whatever the big lesson there was, was the piece that was the gift there. So, um, I went on to have a third baby and I had the most cosmic experience of my life where I learned that to actually go toward the pain rather than away from it and um, to not try to distract myself or um, avoid something but to go fully into it, it then was a gateway into an altered state of consciousness where I had the most amazing experience of my life. And the other thing, just to finish, is that I realised that the dance of each of my births choreographed the relationship that I have with each of those children. So my birth of each of those babies, they're all big now, like Sam is nearly 28, the firstborn who I just told you the story of, and then Ellie's 25 and Jackson is 21 in a couple of weeks. Um, and their births and the experience that I went through with them is really the dynamic of our relationship as mother and child. And I think that's another really helpful thing for mothers when they um, have difficulties in their mothering relationship with their children to actually go back to what the birth held in its um, story. And not that it's kind of like a curse or anything, it's like the opportunity and the sort of like the sacred contract that the two souls have made in heaven to come and be with each other around. And, you know, um, yeah, so that's my story. <laughs>
born at a time when most of the babies in Panama were born at home. I mean, I come home from school, so I never thought about birth as anything extraordinary. I never thought of breastfeeding as anything extraordinary because that's just what people did. You know, in 1949, there was no Similac or anything you could buy in Panama, so women had no options. They just breastfed their babies, and I was a World War II baby. Times were hard, and that's what you did. And uh, so it was always normal for me to hear in the middle of the night cries from the neighbors. You know, the walls were made. We lived in the model army barracks. And, uh, and uh, that the U.S. had set up for black workers to work on the canal. My great-grandparents had built the canal, and my father and my mother worked it. My mother was a maid, so it was very often we just heard babies being born. And so it was just a very natural thing. And I came to the United States uh, in, at the age of 17 to go to school. And uh, it was a very turbulent time that time in the United States. It was the 60s, and uh, it was post-independence uh, of also many Caribbean nations from where many of my ancestors came, because many of the, uh, there were two waves of black people in Panama the original Africans that came during the 14th and 15th century, and then the Africans that came from the Caribbean in the uh, 18th century, 19th century, by Fernando de Lesseps to build the canal. It wasn't successful, but we stayed, and then the U.S. set up an important agency to bring Africans over from the Caribbean because we were thought to be sturdy and resilient against yellow fever. So that's essentially how I ended up there. So I came to the United States because my mother didn't want me to be a maid. She wanted me to be something better. So she figured if I came here, learn English and do well and go to college and get graduate from high school. So here I was, I got caught up in the Black Power Movement in the United States. And, <clears throat> and so upon completion of, Martin Luther King died in 68. And many of the universities had a ha-ha moment. You know, black people can learn. So they, many of them, <laughs> no, they opened up many opportunities and I was prepared. And so the door of opportunity opened and I ended up at Brandeis University in Boston, in Massachusetts. And uh, that was sort of like the beginning of the journey for me. Uh, I got further involved with the black power and the black consciousness movement and my identity as an African woman and what that meant in the context of having been born in Latin America of Caribbean parents and of being a third generation immigrant in Panama and coming as a new immigrant to the United States. So that was very interesting. So upon completion of my uh, undergraduate studies, I decided I had to go to Africa. I had to pursue that. And at that time, I had an opportunity to go to Tanzania. So I graduated June 11th and went on a, on a journey, on an illegal charter flight, kicked out of Canada because I didn't have the right papers, ended up in London, and lo and behold, I ended up in Kenya. I met some people there, and then they told me, you know, there were jobs in Tanzania, and I got a job in Tanzania teaching at the secondary school on the slopes of the Kilimanjaro. And I befriended this wonderful woman, and uh, we really couldn't talk to each other, but she'll come and visit me, and she'll take me at this, to this, you know, to the drumming and the dancing at the village at the school where I taught. It was Wedu Wedu Secondary School in Moshi, you know. Many people go there but never get the opportunity to see the Kili. And I used to see it every morning and every evening for over a year. It was wonderful. And so one day um, she came and she said, come, come, come. You know, and I didn't know. I figured she wanted me to go. And I went with her and I witnessed a birth. You know, it was this woman having her baby. And I had, you know, even though I had heard noises in the night, I'd never actually witnessed a birth. And so um, I said, wow, this is really, really nice. It was very moving. And it was the woman in the village. And, you know, it was just so nice. And I mean, it just seemed pretty, pretty normal. And uh, 
after the one, the baby had been born, it was her fifth girl. She was very disappointed. All she was wondering, this was the area where I was, was the area of the Wachaga people. That's what they're called, the Wachagas. And um, they grew a lot of cashews and sisal. It's beautiful up there. You know, it's very green and stuff on the slopes. And um, she was wondering what would her husband say when he comes back. And she had a fifth girl, so she was kind of disappointed because, you know, she hadn't had any boys. And in retrospect, I guess she was thinking, I got to go through this again. Oh my God. <laughs> so I don't know. I just saw uh, because I we couldn't talk. I couldn't speak Kichaga, and I could barely just say s small words in Kiswahili. But it was just the vibe. Because interestingly enough, this was 1972, and this program that I'd gone there with, I'd been going there for 20 years, but they had never seen a black person from the West. They had heard of stories of black folks coming to, you know, being taken to the West but I'd never seen one, and I was sort of like an anomaly. They expected me to have black and white stripes. They, didn't show, they weren't pretty sure what I was going to look like. And you have to remember, this is 1972. So, um, so they even gave me my first African name. And uh, so I, it was, we went, and we, I couldn't discuss it with anyone, but it was very cool and nice, and the things they did, and I went back. And then I had an epiphany on one of those nights when the moon was clear and it was a full moon and you could see the Kibo and the Mawenzi Peak. Because there are two peaks to the Kili. There's the Smooth Peak and there's the Mawenzi Peak. And there's a story about why those two peaks are like that, but I'll tell you another time. But anyway, um, it was a beautiful night. And, you know, I, had, I was really vibing pretty well and feeling no pain. And I had this stuff, and God told me, you fancy yourself as a revolutionary. You think you are. But if you want to be a real revolutionary, you'll go and catch babies. And I figured, I must have been pretty high, because, you know, <laughs> that was definitely not on my radar screen. I was going to be a historian. I was going to say the reason why we came from so high and ended up where we are. I was going to you know, retell this story, this great story of how Africa had come to the point where it was. Me, being a midwife, getting into that, hell to the no, I wasn't going to do that. I was never going to be a nurse, I was never going to be a teacher, because those are the only two options that women had at that time, and especially as a so-called educated African descendant. And I most certainly was not going to do the normal woman routine, so I just didn't pay that any attention. But it kept coming back. I kept had this calling. And I said, OK. And then after I finished my sojourn in uh, Tanzania, I went to Uganda on a, you know, that time you could really hitchhike over Africa easily and without any fear. Even in the United States, you could hitchhike all over. And, and so I hitchhiked, and I'd gone to Congo, to Mumbashi, and ended up in Uganda, and it was the most beautiful place that I'd ever seen. And I got involved with this African-American doctor. Well, he was working on a project there called Africa Basic Foods, and which was working on Kwasha Corps and in you know addressing the, 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 the different health disparities that came from the impact of introduction of European foods and what it had done. And uh, it was so interesting, and I witnessed some more birds, and I said, okay, when I get back to the United States, I'm going to try to get into this stuff. And when I got back here, it was at the height of the women help movement, and I got involved with some sister friends that were, you know, had taken the opportunity, because black people were not involved. There were very different movements going on. White uh, people had their movement, and black folks, we had our movement. And white people had actually, white women had become empowered from taking part in the civil rights movement. And from that was born because the black movement was in the vanguard. So we said, okay, we'll have our own movement. And Elijah Muhammad was coming out with, you know, you have to eat to live. And we were saying, off the pig, no more pig, eating well, and getting back into our roots, our healing roots. And I got caught up in that movement. And it was from there I said, okay, I have to be obedient to the Most High. And I got involved in birthing. And uh, we, we were just like, my sister Um Salama always said, we were dumb and lucky. Because nobody knew what we were doing. We were just dumb and lucky, you know. We just figured, you know, you just go and you help the woman. And 
it's easy, you know, and uh, that's what happened. And we began studying on our own and doing those kinds of things. And I became more and more involved in uh, working at times with the Boston Women's Health Collective and setting up feminist health centers to keep women out of the gynecologist's office because that's the kind of stuff we were doing at the time. So my partner, my, hus my husband, uh, my fiance at the time, he went back to Michigan to go work in his PhD and I said, okay. I go and I went and I got my degree in public health and began working with um, the African Bird Collective in Detroit and got more involved in birth and studying more about it, and that's how I really got involved more in developing my skills. And then in 1980, I had my birth. And um, so trust in birth was never an issue for me because it just was like, you know, having your period, it was just something that you did, so it was part of my, it was part of my being. But having your own is something else. And so when I decided to have a home birth, um, my mother, who by this time just could not understand what had happened to her nice little girl she had sent for Bella. <laughs> but in some way, she really liked that I was very fervently committed to preserving the culture and the roots. So she was very, very happy about that. And so when I told her I was having a baby, doing more of my own self-care, my own prenatal care, and you know, I would like for her to come to the birth, so she was so happy because I'm the youngest of all her children. I have a 78-year-old brother. And so um, she, uh, she was so happy and she came and uh, she said, you know, I gave birth to seven children. She had twins before me and they, they passed maternal depletion, but she had babies right after each other towards the end of her childbearing years. And uh, so she was so happy. She says, I've seen my baby having a baby. And it was so nice. And she was there with me. And it was one of the most beautiful things. Because even though she was sitting in the seat sometimes just looking, she was just amazed. Here I was walking around naked going into the bath, walking up and down the stairs. Even though she had had all natural birth, she had never seen anything like this. She just thought, I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, she came to America, she came crazy. But um, she was, in some way, she was so happy to see that I'd embrace, you know, a lot of things that, you know, a lot of natural things in her head. And uh, after I had my son, it was a very difficult birth, and in many ways, because he was direct OP. And he was born sunny side up, so you can only imagine. So when my sister talked about surrendering, I can recall my midwife saying to me, I think your baby's getting tired. He's ready to go up. And I just said to myself, I looked at my mother, and she just went like that. And I just went to this light. I figured, I cannot do anything about this. I just have to surrender. And it, I just had another epiphany that giving birth is seeing God. Because it was at that time I said, I'm not fighting it anymore. And when I decided to just surrender, all I heard, I, I swear I never pushed that boy out. All I heard once I gave in and said, God, you just have to take me. My baby was born, and I heard the midwife saying, oh my God, the baby's there. The baby's there. Oh, she must have torn. That's, these are the things that I'm hearing. And all I could see, I saw my baby came up like this, and I lift him up. I have a picture of it, and I just cried. I couldn't believe I had done this, that this baby had just come out of me. And I realized something. My contractions were never closer than four or five minutes apart because God knows that this baby had to take its time. And I was in the space that I could take that time and do what I had to do without all these negative forces whirling in my head. And never once when my mother came did she says, oh girl, you shouldn't do this, because it wasn't something that was unusual in her experience. She was just in some ways happy that I had embraced some of those things and didn't think that I'd become so Americanized, you know, 
that I could leave those things behind because a lot of immigrants, they come here and they have a wonderful culture, birth culture, that they sometimes give up because they think that this is better. And so I didn't buy that ticket that it was better, but I didn't know it was the kind of work that it had, you know. But it was nice and I had my boy. He's 33 now, most going to be 33 and a half. I'm still waiting for him to give me a grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter is 27 and I still have no grandchild. She's going to be 28 soon, so I'm just saying, well, it is what it is. I have lots of babies and one day I'll have a grandchild. But that to me was, you know, it was very informing. And I was, when she asked to pick a birth, I've had so many wonderful experiences that have made me so much of a better human being. It was very hard to pick any, but... I had another, and, and another thing was three years ago, I started going forward to Africa again and getting involved in birds. And I've seen so many birds that helped me because after spending most of my birth and experience in the United States, even as a home birth, a hospital midwife, or bird center midwife, or stuff, you lose sense of reality because I don't even believe in natural childbirth. I think it's an oxymoron. Childbirth is natural. I mean, all these different things that we say, oh, this and that. I mean, we make it all esoteric, but it's really just life. You know, and Africa really taught me that in many different ways. And most recently, I had a, uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, yes, it was, yeah, the baby's maybe, when July 6th, well, it's almost a month now, the baby was born, and it was a very difficult birth because I hadn't done a birth like that in a long time. I was there for about three days, three days with this woman. And she was just prodroming away, but having some very powerful contractions. I mean, I got her and her, her, her partner to smooch to, to do this. I said, turn it on, do whatever you want to do, whatever the energy is, put that baby in. And this was a very loving, nurturing couple. But her mother was in her head. Her mother was in her head because her mother had told her two days ago that she really did not approve of what she was doing. She hadn't approved of it. And they got into a terrible argument. And I wasn't aware of that. And I kept saying, where did I miss what was going on here? How did I miss this? And so she kept calling for her mother. So I said, well, why don't you call your mother? I turned and I said, let's call her mother. <laughs> 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 so, I said, okay, I figured then something was going on. So at some point, when I couldn't figure out what was happening, her powers were very weak. I mean, this, every, she was having contractions maybe every seven or ten minutes. And I said, God, we're going to get a baby out of here. <laughs> and, um, but it, she was... You know, the baby was telling me it was okay, and the vibration was okay. So I couldn't figure out what was askew. And so finally we went into the kitchen, and he told me they had had an argument. His mother, her mother didn't feel very good about it, because her sister had just been sectioned, and her mother didn't think she could do it. She was the weakest of her mother's seven children. She was only four pounds. And I think this was in her head. So um, finally... Um, I said, well, look, this is not going. I'm tired, you're tired, the uterus is tired, let's go to sleep. And uh, we went to sleep, and I said, look, this baby is well placed against the cervix, and I generally don't do this, but I need to give you something to sleep. So we drank some manzanilla, and I told her, we're going to take about 100 milligrams of Benadryl. Catecholamines is fair. I said, you know, you just know that you're with God, that Everything's okay, this baby's fine, but you gotta clear your head and you have to sleep, and I'm tired. And so we slept. I said, something's gonna happen. This is gonna knock out this pattern, or you're gonna come and you're gonna be open and you're gonna have a baby. And lo and behold, she awoke five hours later in transition. And we had a nice baby with. Her rushes coming every 10 minutes, never closely together. Wow. And that showed me that, you know, there's no normalcy. Normalcy is your normal at that moment in time. 
And it was just, God is always sending me these experiences to keep me grounded, to keep it real, let me know that there is something bigger than me in all of this. And just as I can't take credit for the good birds, I can't take credit for the bad ones I've had either, that I'm just a vehicle. So it keeps me very grounded. You know, it keeps ego out of the way. And I just, I'm just happy to be invited to sacred events and to learn to love my ladies. And they love me and you know, we just have fun and I'm very blessed to know that I have, I'm now having babies with babies, you know, you have babies three times in a family and there are a lot of families there's, that I just love and they love me and I feel very safe, you know, and what else you need in this world to know that you have people who love you and you love them, so I'm rich, even though I don't have a pension and I can't retire ever. <laughs> Having fun because some of the other women were so stoic 
you couldn't get into a connection and a vibe with them. But with her, she was such a free spirit, and she just did whatever she wanted to do. She took off her clothes. She took off her clothes. She was butt naked. She would not stay in the room. She would run outside the In the butt. She just butt in the dirt. She was. She'd come back in. We'd chase her back into the room. They want to get her on the table. As soon as she let her go, she'd run yeah. back outside, run to the light, and slide into the dirt. And, 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 the, and they're having a fit because you have to lay on the table with your arms crossed like this. Oh and my God. We have been waiting to see somebody come Just in and them. say, I'm going to burn my way. My way. <laughs> it's going to be my way. They used to even give her value to try to, like, oh, no. Not, not the nature out of her. And it was our last night, and, and we just kind of, I don't, you might be thinking that's all, we didn't fight real hard to get her to do it our way. No. Because we were just, we were just laughing. This was, it was, it was, it was not, funny. At the end of three weeks, a reaffirmation that no matter what the World Health Organization says, no matter what somebody else says, no matter what is imposed on a woman by an outside force, you give her a chance. And nature is going to take her to the place where she has to go. Mm -hmm. And all we have Amen. to do is make sure she doesn't get hurt mm -hmm. and that the baby's okay. And that's we mocked it. Was, we, were, we were fake it like we were trying to make her do that. <laughs> So the only thing I was worried about was the cleanup because there's nobody there's nobody there to clean up. So if you make a mess and there's all this blood over the place, you gotta clean it up. So that was the only part. I learned my lesson. I mean, it's not easy, you know, because it's not like you have everything running and available to you. No. When I thought about the stories that I wanted to share, I have to tell you I had more than one or two. And I'm sure that's true of all of us. So, I kind of let the stories surface in my brain, and what helped me decide it was what helped mold us and make us. I kind of think of it as what moved my tent pegs <laughs> to more space within me to expand myself. So the stories that surfaced were, um, for me to go into the Amish and the Mennonite communities, I was up in Lorain, Ohio. I had left Columbus and Mansfield, moved up to be with Dennis, had my daughter Ananda, our daughter Ananda up there, and um, I had this woman call me who was very, she had a very soft voice. She wanted to know if I was Mary Cooper, the midwife, and I said I was. She said, well, I want you to help me with my baby. And I said, okay, when would you like to come? You can make an appointment. And she said, oh, I can't come to your house. And, and I said, oh, I'm sorry. Um, she said, there's just no way I could come and I didn't understand it and I said I don't know if I could help you and she said okay and hung up and there was no, really no way for me to get a hold of her a year later the same lady calls me back and she says could you help me this year with my baby <laughs> and so I was so happy that she called me back and I said could you tell me why you can't come to my house and she said, it's too far for my horse to come. I said, okay. <laughs> I was having my, my borders expanded already. And so I said, where do you live? And she was a good hour away from me. And I said, I will come to you. And so she had heard about me, and I helped her have her baby, and there were more 
of the Mennonite ladies who asked me to help her. And then the Amish community picked up that I was willing, that I was respectful of their ways, that I wouldn't speak in front of the children because um, pregnancy and childbirth was between the husband and the wife, the man and the woman. It wasn't something to do that I would talk to the children about. I respected them. I wore a skirt and because they wanted ladies to be ladies. Um, that I didn't talk a, hard, a lot, you know, I could be quiet. <laughs> and so I helped her. And then there was um, a young Amish girl who was having her first baby. And she asked me if I thought it was okay that she was having her baby at home, and I told her I did. So that she asked if the, her name was Edna. And Edna asked me, could my mother be present? And I said, of course. So when Edna went to have her baby, I don't do a whole lot of internals because it, it interferes with what the lady's doing. It interferes with that birth energy. And I remember the first time I was going to have somebody put their fingers in me, and I was very embarrassed, you know. Um, and I was pretty modest, and I knew it had to happen, but I sure wish they got it over with, you know, and all those things. So um, I did say sometimes, though, to make sure that you're complete, um, I may do a very quick check. And she thought that was all right. Her mother gave her approval. And so when I did, I felt a little toe. It was the first breech baby. And I said to her, I can't help you with this baby. And she said, why not? I said, I've never helped with a breech birth before. And she said to me, well, I know I can do it. I just need somebody to help me. Would you help me? And in there, I had a real paradigm shift. My tent pegs really got moved. I said to her, I've never helped with a breech baby. And she said, that's okay. You can just help me. I know that I can do this. I made a decision that she is the one that gave me courage. Mm -hmm. She was the woman in labor, but she's the one that midwifed me. Oh, wow. <laughs> Mother never said a word. And um, about that time, her water broke, and I, and I, uh, she became the teacher, as I said. And she went on. I watched this little foot become an ankle and a knee, and I wondered where the other foot was. <laughs> you know. And so I said to her, "Oh, I forgot a real important part of the story." When I told her, Edna, I don't know if I can help you, she said, well, what's going to happen to me? And I said, well, the other times, women have gone in and they've had surgery. They've had to have a C-section. And she says, well, what is my choice? I said, well, since I've never done that, I don't know what would be presenting. And back then, if you couldn't find a, a part of a presenting baby, you went in to feel what was there. And I said, I've never done that. And she said, well, you can do that. And I said, but it would hurt you. And she looked at me and she said, and don't you think it's going to hurt if they cut me open? <laughs> and, wow. and she said, I know I can do this. Now I'm back on track. 
<laughs> she said, I know I can do this. I just need somebody to help me. And I want you to help me. And so when this it was the right foot that came out, <laughs> I was really praying the other foot was just coming. <laughs> and it wasn't. And it came down and I said, I don't know where the other foot is. <laughs> now, I knew it was up there, but I didn't know where it was. And I'm talking in the early 80s. So I gently put my hand in and felt a knee. And, you know, there was a, there was a foot, and I said, okay, you just do what your body tells you. And I figured that was a pretty good midwife cop-out. <laughs> sure is. It is. It's a very good one. I do it often. I don't know what to do. So she pushed, and pretty soon there was a knee, and the knee came out, and the foot flopped out. And she pushed, and the little, it was just like the... the the baby said, all right, you two are in agreement. I'm going to help you out. The little hands were together and another push. The baby slid out. And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said to myself, I wonder what all this fuss is about breech burn. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I knew I could do it. And I said, you're absolutely right. Mother never said anything. She, you know, then she said to me later, you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I had my first breech baby. Because this woman midwifed me and taught me. And I have one other quick story to tell you. I recently, and recently is a year ago, um, I had two sisters that were in labor, and they were due about six weeks apart. Now, Alma was on her second baby, and she had a very easy birth. And she said she was a little concerned about her sister, Melinda, because she'd always been... Um, not sickly, but she wasn't as strong as she thought she should be. So that when Melinda went into labor, because they live so close, she asked me, she said, can Henry and I come to your house to have the baby? I said, sure you can. You can come and you can stay. I'll feed you, and when you feel strong enough, then I'll take you back home. So um, she was in and out of labor for two days. And she struggled with this labor. It hurt her. And I knew that. And I would give her comfort, you know, and talk to her and say, you can do this. And um, she went through a period where she had a cervical lip from about 11 to 2. And I would encourage her and um, that you're almost there. That's one last contraction that you don't have to do when you're one step closer to holding your baby. And here's your tidbit. She had room at the bottom of the baby's head. I tried putting her on her left side and her right side for that cervix to slip back. And a lot of times, um, if you have room at 6 o'clock, because, and you've got this tight cervix, you've got this cervical lip, you have the probability of having a compound presentation with the little hand being there, which lifts the baby up because the hand is there. Now sometimes if you feel the hand, you can tap a finger sometimes and the baby will move it down, the head will flop down and the lip disappears. So there's your tidbit. <laughs> So when this cervical lip was done, and I said, you'll really like pushing, you know, because you can be active with your body. You can be active, you know, you'll get a pushing urge. And um, it was harder than she thought. And at one point, I said to her, 
when this baby's born, I'm going to pinch him because he made it so hard for you. And she said to me, okay. <laughs> when she had, she had her son, and this little boy um, was eight too. And uh, she rested, and I fed her, and she got up, and she sat in the chair. And I said to her, Oh, Melinda, I forgot to pinch that baby because he, he made it so hard for you. And she took that baby and pulled it in, and she said, You may not. <laughs> Which is what I wanted to hear. And I, I told her, I'm so proud of you. I said, that was harder labor than most first-time moms have. And she looked at me, and she started to cry. And she said, Mary, I'm so embarrassed. I said, why? And she said, I gave up 17 times. The first thing that I thought of was, you counted? <laughs> very quickly, and I looked at her because she was so crushed, and I said, Melissa, Melinda, we all give up. The beauty of it is, is that you were willing 18 times. And she looked at me and she said, I was, wasn't I? I said, yes, and you would have been willing if it had you had given up 20 times. And I said, that is part of the journey from being, coming in a maid and leaving a mom. I said, you were willing 18 times. I only wanted to say, all of this wisdom, and you've heard me say it again, but I think it's worth bearing, all of the wisdom all of us have ever received is because of the little rounded bellies that have walked through our doors. To her, to her, birth was a part of life. 
And it really inspired me throughout my life that I always had my grandmother's birth stories in the back of my head and, and things that she'd said to me along the way in my life that, you know, birth was just part of life. She was literally out working in the garden, plowing the back 40 till contractions got so hard that she had to come in. And she'd boil the water and send her husband away to town to get the doctor. <laughs> Never made it back a time. And, you know, to her, it was just an extension of her workday. 